like uh, all of that sort of fun stuff. Um, then I'm going to talk about why these skills are important. And then at the end, talk about some key skills as you're learning now, some things that you should learn to pick up um, because it's going to be very valuable for you in getting a job and 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 being successful in, in your career in tech. Okay. So first, a bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm the co-CEO of Summer of Tech. Uh, back in 2006, I started Summer of Tech. Uh, back then, it was called the Summer of Code. Uh, but like on the right, here's a sort of like a, a little map that I did for another talk this year of like what I've done. So like many of you, um, I went to university. I went to Victoria University and uh, 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 unbelievably, Pondy is still there. Pondy taught me in my first year um, and he's still there. Uh, and much to my amusement, most of the math teachers are still there. I think they, they and, and they're still wearing the same clothes that they wore um, cough, cough 30 years ago. So that's crazy. So um, basically uh, became a, a coder. I, I was called a... Um, uh, an analyst programmer that was the role I worked for a government department um, but I actually did programming and sysadmin work and then I got to um, work for National Bank which uh, was bought by ANZ um, about 10 years ago 15 years ago something like that um, worked for there and this, this is in the 90s uh, and then I ended up going to the UK and um, and wanted to seek my fame and fortune in doing my big OE in the UK. So I had about three years experience or four years experience in New Zealand. Went to the UK, did a systems admin role for a few companies. Ended up getting uh, becoming a system admin for an auction site. Um, so like trade me, work for a startup. Uh, this is back in 1999, if I remember correctly. Um, so the internet was booming, it was crazy, they were spending crazy money, they had um, 12 million pounds of investment um, came in when I joined. When I joined them, I was like employee 34, I worked there for four months, they, were, um, they grew to 150 people, they were developing 24 by 7, right, they had teams, they, we had three shifts of coders, and they ran every day, it was nuts. Uh, for, for my sins, I ended up looking after the system for two shifts. So I'd get there some point in the morning and leave very late at night. It got so bad that um, I'd catch the last tube and end up falling asleep on the tube and end up like 20 kilometers away from my house that they sent me and a number of people um, in uh, mini cabs home so that we would get home and get some sleep rather than wake up in some random location. Um, but in that time that I was in this crazy um, place, um, uh, the lead programmer and I was basically the lead systems guy, uh, one night at 3 a.m. when we were doing um, a migration um, of our, or an upgrade of our server, um, he says to me, why the hell are we doing this for somebody else? We should do this for ourselves. And so we did. We started an auction site um, and it ended up being a multinational we had offices in um, Sydney, in uh, Bombay, and in South Africa. Um, and I ended up um, taking over and, and running the office in India. And we ended up merging with another company called Bazi.com, where I became CTO. And I exited just before they got bought by eBay. Um, and so at that point of time, I was like, oh. I know lots about tech, but don't really know about business and doing businessy things. So I went and came back to, to New Zealand and did an MBA um, down at the Pipitea campus down in Wellington. Um, then um, started my own software company called Project X. Um, we did bespoke mapping solutions. So about the time Google Maps came out, we were doing equivalent stuff. Um, worked with Trade Me, worked with um, a number of banks and, and, and places. Um, and then... Uh, as as many things was was looking for something different around my business and and, and um, was sort of struggling didn't really want to do that anymore um, so ended up um, 
being a tech guy for a couple of companies, uh, but ended up being a, a BA at zero, um, and then became into the what we call product, which is product management. So it's more on the sort of half tech, half business side. Uh, and then um, beginning of last year, I, I, I stopped um, being at zero. I was an engineering manager, so hiring lots of devs. Um, and um, then now come back to doing business at, at um, Hatch. So I've sort of flip flop between doing tech, doing business stuff and all that sort of time. So, you know, from uh, and, and while I did all of that stuff, I, I did summer of tech um, from 2006, right? So have been involved um, heavily in, in that process. Um, so one, one ran it uh, myself uh, until about, uh, hang on, I think 2008, 2008, I went to the Wellington Mayor and said, can we have some money? And they said, no, you can't have some money, but I'll introduce you to a person called Ruth McDavid. And um, Ruth is uh, part of uh, like the Economic Development Agency um, of Wellington, and um, she ended up uh, giving us some of their time, so they, they were supporting us that way. And a few years later, I managed to convince Ruth to actually um, become our employee number one um, at Summer of Tech. So as you can see, I, I've I, I've done I've done tech. I've been in the weeds. I've built software. I've made websites. I've done all that stuff up to um, being part of some really big, really big um, companies. So it's been it's been an interesting journey. So how is this relevant to the cloud? So going back to when I started. Um, and when I was at university, so, so where you are now, um, my value was that I could build things and get them to run. Um, one of the things that I, I did was I built games. Um, so back there we had uh, Unix boxes. Um, we didn't have PCs. Um, that wasn't really popular at that stage. We had Unix boxes, so it was like we wanted something that we could, uh, a multiplayer that we could, game that we could play. So... Um, I used to scavenge websites. Uh, there were a few websites that used to actually be user, group, user groups for people giving information on how to get stuff to run. Because what we discovered is like uh, the system, the university system, wouldn't have all the libraries to run the code. And so you had to do uh, trawl FTP sites and all this sort of stuff to get something running. And um, I picked up lots and lots of skills on how to do that. Um, so that, so it's, you know, I learned by building. Um, building this hard to find code and building systems by hand um, and sort of understanding how to how to get it to run right and um, you know I did this at university but not in class so they didn't teach me any of this stuff I just did it on the side and the interesting thing is that when I started working it was perceived as being really really valuable it gave me an edge compared to my you know classmates is I knew how to do all of these things. Um, my first job, uh, I, I worked as a sysadmin, you know, I said product uh, analyst programmer, um, and I worked when Linux came out. So Linux was literally a year old when I started work. And um, my first job was to compile it to work on my desktop, right? And um, so that's what I did as my first job uh, and, and, and basically grew up learning and using Linux from, from the get-go, which was really, really beneficial. So as I sort of progressed through my career, um, I learned to build scalable systems, right? So from that government department where I touched databases, touched servers, um, built some internet sites. We, we had, I think we were the second um, government website um, up in New Zealand. I learned how to do all this stuff. Uh, and then I went to a bank. And so a bank is like, you know, just massive, massive um, uh, difference in scale. And so that was really, really interesting to understand how all these things fit together, uh, have understanding redundancy and backup systems. And, um, you know, ba banks basically had a low risk tolerance, which meant they wanted things to be redundant beyond all measure. Um, and so that gave me an opportunity to learn, like, at this really high level, um, how all this stuff fit together and, and all these sort of systems. Um, I realized that these skills were valuable, and, and you know, like most Kiwis, I had that itch to go overseas, and I mentioned I went to London, and, and my goal was to get an internet job. Um, and 
initially it took me a while like i i i went through two or three other jobs until i got that job at that auction site right but what i did the first job i landed when i got to to london was with visa so i sort of went from uh working on a um a bank you know in new zealand a big bank and then went and worked a visa which was just another scale um and in terms of crazy stories of working for visa um i was you know responsible for building the development system that they were going to do this um uh work for a project for visa for, at this company and part of the process is i had to get the visa encryption key um which you can only get from their production system and so visa have a bunker somewhere in england and i have nowhere where idea where it is because i went in a completely blacked out van and they drove around and did all these crazy loops so i wouldn't have any sense of where the hell we were we went into this place um under the ground into this um facility that was uh, armed you know basically it was uh, lots of people and 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 they had security guards with machine guns right well, i had to go in there um, with another guy and his responsibility was to carry the key my responsibility was to um, give him the instructions to get the key off the production system because um, with that key we were going to take a snippet of production data anonymize it and de and decrypt it so that we could use it in the um, development system to ensure that we could build it right so i had to issue these instructions um to my buddy with my back to the computer i had to tell him what to do and meanwhile there's a guy with a machine gun facing at me and, a, and another guy with a machine gun facing at him all right and so it's just completely surreal experience um uh to, to go that but you know w what i learned um from working that with that system was to to work at you know a bank was at this level and visa was like 10 times above that level right um and then as i said i got a job um doing internet and then started an internet company the auction company i started um with my co-founder that in that 3 a.m in the in a uh, uh, in england was called bitter buy um it still operates today it's the biggest auction site in all of africa um it's the african site that's still there um but i had to build the infrastructure and so you know all that knowledge i had from doing the stuff for the bank and for visa suddenly it was like all right the internet's come along i'll take all that knowledge and be able to build a scalable infrastructure and then i went from um you know we had a website in in i said south africa australia and india i ended up um going over and taking over the the become the sort of the general manager or ceo of our indian operation we merged with another company called buzzy um and that was like a baptism of fire because not only at that stage of the the, the internet the internet in india was rubbish like in terms of like they're on really bad dial-ups and it really wasn't um that great but you just had a lot of people right so i got to learn how to deal with um 500 000 concurrent users or 4 million people you send an email out to 4 million people and uh what happens they come to the website the website's got to um you know actually respond and stay up and do all these things so you know it was a little bit of a baptism by fire but came out of this stuff with heaps and heaps of knowledge about how all these core things worked right so um a little bit of a chat about like w what was different back then so back then we had this idea of you know the box the server was we called it bare metal right so it was like it means that was your server you looked after it and um you had to know everything about it so you know you bought the server it was racked up in a facility you had all the cabling all of that sort of stuff so you had to know about that the server and the hardware and all the intricacies there you had to know about linux you had to know about package management so that's like having all of the components and all, um, all the things that you wanted installed all the libraries and all that sort of stuff we needed to know about switches so we had to obviously build a, a network we had to know about load balances um, databases back in those days we didn't trust the open source ones because they were not proven we were using oracle um and you know oracle we we're paying uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for the license to use oracle right and we're also using commercial application servers because back then the open source ones were not not deemed reliable but not only with this stuff you know 
complicated and expensive and, and, and to scale was expensive, we had to have lots of people with different skills to run all of that stuff. We needed sysadmins to deal with all the system stuff. We needed network engineers to deal with the switches and load balances. We needed DBAs to deal with the DBA, you know, database stuff and make that scale. And then the coders, their responsibility is they need to be responsible for the application service, right? So um, you just, it was a lot of, lot of knowledge that people needed to know back then that was quite niche. So, you know, coders did their stuff and handed it over to the system guys, like, are you guys going to deploy that for this? You know, the system guys work closely with the network guys to make sure that things are scale and all of that sort of stuff, right? And we'd always be relying on the DBA to make sure that the whole thing didn't fall apart. Because ultimately, when it came to scalability, it used to always be that the deep, um, the database was the bottleneck. Um, one of the key things about this time that stood me in good stead is understanding um, and I think it's actually a forgotten understanding or forgotten skill is understanding the difference between static and dynamic um, content on the internet. So static is think of a web page, right? It's like, um, let's say it's a blog post or something like that. So it's just, it's a piece of text with some images and all of that sort of stuff. So in terms of, you know, ability and performance of a system, um, you can fetch that really fast. A web server well, basically, it does a file transfer to fit, fetch the HTML that, that's there. That's super, super fast, right? Um, and you can scale out, your web server can scale out thousands and thousands of requests a second when it's only that. When it's dynamic, I'm meaning you've got an application involved, you've got some JavaScript, you've got some code running, you're hitting a database, that takes time for you to run all those queries and do all of that stuff, right? And um, so this matters. This stuff matters. And I'll give you an example. So um, when I ran that company that made map, bespoke map stuff, we went and did a partnership with TradeMe and we did we, we, we did a pitch. And part of this was um, we offered these services to TradeMe uh, and they said, look, you know, look, um, we're the biggest website in all of New Zealand at the state, you know, that stage was only basically Google was bigger than them at, at back, back at that stage. And, um, you know, stuff has to be fast. So you've got to prove that whatever you guys do and the services that you provide can can um, scale. And so I said, cool, Pepsi Challenge, let's go. And because I knew about this stuff, we were, what I didn't know was we were actually being compared against the, another competitor and, and their system was a dynamic um, you know application whereas you type in a map location it would go off and process it and show you a map and what we had built is an um, uh, often open source version of like google maps so it's like you're typing and you're browsing around and you're seeing everything in real time and so basically we won hands down so like we won they they, they talked to a number of companies because they wanted this capability at trade me and we won it and the reason we won it is because I knew how the internet worked and those guys didn't, right? They literally were using an old style application. It wasn't modern, it didn't work very fast, And but I knew. And and that was one of the things that Sam Morgan, who was the head of Trade Me back in those days, he said, you just seem to know how this shit works and we trust you. You, you know how this, like why it's important to us. So let's do it. And so I ended up working together. And that was, you know, a thing that even today when I look at a lot of um, websites and, 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 you know, when I see slow stuff, I'm going, they just don't understand this stuff, right? And I've actually, um, during that time, a few, you know, a dozen years ago, I was a consultant. I used to do a bit of consulting on the side to help people build scalable websites. Um, and one of the companies I had lots of chats with was Geonet, right? So Geonet that does the earthquakes. And they were like, look, we, we've got a problem that when an earthquake happens, everybody hits our site. And um, during the Christchurch earthquake, they had three and a half thousand requests um, a second, right? Uh, which is like um, super high for, for a, um, you know, normally they've got a trickle of people, but when an earthquake comes, they get flooded. And the key difference is after we spoke together, they used to have a dynamic system. They changed it to static. What they did is um, they pre-generated the pages, which used to be dynamic requests, and made them static and just refreshed it every minute. And so that way they were ha able to handle this massive, massive traffic that used to come in. 
um, for them. And, you know, it saved him a fortune and, you know, the service worked and everybody, you know, everybody came back happy rather than, you know, you had a website and you're just waiting forever, right? So this is a key insight that, you know, I hope that you will um, pick up and uh, learn as you build your career that n nothing will be a static website. Now let's talk a little bit of the journey from being a sysadmin into being DevOps. So back in the day, this is how things used to work. So when I started, um, we used to deploy code by hand. So, you know, you, you'd have a copy of, of, of the website or, or the application on your, on your box. You'd run it, you'd make all the changes, um, and then you'd take literally a copy of the code, you would FTP it up to production, and then compile it on production and, and, and hope it worked, right? And then they do the same thing across every one of the servers. If you had more than one server, you used to just FTP this up um, to this process, right? So craziness. So, so it was all done by hand. And so what would end up happening is like developers would build, toss it across the sysadmins, the sysadmins would then deploy it out to all these servers to get it to run, right? And there were lots of problems, right? Um, that, that could happen because of that. And I'll get into that in a second. I'll talk about the pros and cons. So from there, the next sort of evolution is we deployed by script, is we had a bunch of um, uh, um, systems that enabled us to basically use a command line or even sometimes they'd build a website that meant you could click and it would deploy. So you would build it on your machine, then you'd then check in all your code into the source management, and then we'd hit a button and it'd deploy it out to production, right? And the way that we got consistency over those boxes in production is we cloned them. It's like we, we took a box, we got it in the state that we wanted, and then we cloned it as we took an image of it, and then we copied that image into another server, so on and so forth. So it used to be very manual, but that was the way that we can ensure that each one was consistent. Compared to the hand-rolled boxes was someone just installing the box and doing the stuff, hoping that he got everything right, right? And, and sometimes there were, there were differences. So then we move from there into into this sort of containerization, which is close to where we are now. And so then what would happen is you'd build it in a container on your machine, and that would have a complete instance r running in a virtual machine on yours. And then you, your code and that instance of the server would be committed into source control um, as a set of instructions to which, again, we go through a command line, boom, that goes out to production, and then it's building up these these containers. Right, so you had several containers of, of what, what was going on. So that was huge as a, as, as a change because then we knew that, you know, what was on my machine uh, was what was in production, right? And that was, that was big. So it was, again, like we weren't tossing it over the fence to the system guys. We were starting to work together so that we had that control and making sure that that got. So then we evolved into code you know, infrastructure as code where the config files and source files are get built locally and then that gets out as a, a set of build instructions to go and get built on the internet but that what changed is with the the, the containers we started looking at each thing as a bunch of services right so the database is a service there's a there's a different container for that there's uh, the application is a, a different um, container then we might have other sort of components of our application sitting in these containers that we had much more fine gain control. So it's sort of an evolution of of going from containers to then going, hang, hang on, why don't we containerize everything and figure out how that worked? So one of the interesting things when I look at this um, is that, you know, and you think about DevOps, is you're moving from this idea of pets to cattle. So going back to this, when we deployed by hand, those servers were our pets. We looked after them by hand. We, you know, we fed them. We we had to patch them. We had to do all this stuff. It wasn't done by a set of scripts. It was just done by by hand, and that meant that we had human error, all right? Because someone could have done something on one box and it wasn't done on another, and you're like, why is this running differently on these two different servers? Not sure. You know, and you had to go to and do a hell of a lot of work to try figure out the difference. And sometimes it was due to the fact that when it was built, so like we built one, and then six months later we built the second one, 
that six months later, the version, that library version, he just got the latest version, happened to change. And it happened to conflict with the code that was originally running. So we had to deal with all these code conflicts and all this sort of crazy stuff, right? So it was just nutsoid. Um, but that's how it used to be. But then when you get to, you know, now, you think of, we, we don't actually care about a box. If it fails, we'll just spin up another one, right? So the idea of a cattle as being a replaceable asset. So instead of what we, before, we used to look after and monitor and be really close, like, can't let the server go down. Now we operate like we expect it to die. We expect it that it has a useful life. And actually, we will recycle these things to ensure that we've got consistency and reliability and the best performance. So you, you it's a complete mind shift change um, from you know looking after something to like, okay, it only has a, a certain lifespan, and we know that, but we build that into the way that we run, right? So that was a, a sort of a key concept that that changed the way that we thought. Um, when we have a look at these things, um, let's go and have a look at it quickly at the. The pros and cons of, of like how we used to do stuff so you know back in the day um when we deployed by hand it was super easy right it was simple and easy to get started because you're like you just compile it up on machine you hand it over to the system guy I, I, you know I, i'm gonna have a holiday now i'll wait for him to deploy it, it was, no, no problems right um but it was quite time consuming because you had to go through a whole bunch of set of hands and you had to be really sure that everything worked right and there were, as I said, lots of people required to make this work, right? The other thing about this is rolling back was hard. So if a mistake happened, there was a bug in the code, you just FTP'd it out to a bunch of servers. It took ages to get put the old versions back and required someone to do that in a command line and all this sort of crazy stuff, right? So it was, it was nuts. When things went wrong, it went wrong like crazy. And... Definitely, um, we had this uh, thing which is works on my machine, and I'll show you a, a fun a graphic about that in a minute. But what really was, it's like the developer says, it works on my machine. Why isn't it working in production? Because the production isn't the same as your machine, right? And that had that siloed thinking because we had, you know, systems guys and network guys and, and coders. They weren't thinking all the same things. They weren't aware of all the same stuff. And so it was sort of like, you know, not my problem. So it was a big change when we went to deploy by script. So we sort of got into a command line or one-click deployment, right? And so you could press a button or run a command. It would deploy out to the servers, and you could see what it was doing. And then if there's a problem, you roll it back. You know, you just hit the rollback command, and it would roll everything back, right? And so this was great because it, it meant that you could go across a number of services, and you know what was going. You could actually see what was happening, and it wasn't done by hand. So it was like the system is doing it. We can track the progress of this, and we can do that. We can do it um, a bit more efficiently, right? Um, this had a bit of an initial start setup cost because you had to set up all these scripts and get all of these things to work. Um, it tended to, to work differently and and the way that people set it up is like you deploy the code that would be one set of scripts and stuff and the database would be something different and so sometimes these would get out of sync and you get into some issues and um we always had these problems with like sometimes the servers would misbehave and you can never quite figure out what the hell was going on so there, there's always these situations like I deployed it but one of them isn't behaving and and it would invariably be some version of a library or something wasn't quite right but it was like nuts when we went on to containers you know we're building this infrastructure with code um, and we had these images um, that was that we could get images from the internet so what was really cool is you could get moving really fast to so say you needed Ruby or you needed C sharp or whatever it is someone had already done a container that had all the things that you needed so you could take that from the internet make all the changes add your code on and you were sweet so you didn't have to build everything yourself right and the fact that that was shareable um was brilliant because it's like you know getting set up um is a big big deal when i first went um to zero if you were a developer who started at zero used to take um, anywhere between three to five days to get the code to run on your on your machine. They had this massive document that you had to follow all these steps. And even though it was a document that hundreds of people had gone through, it still would muck up and people would still, you know, following the instructions exactly, it would not work, right? And if you go from that to, 
okay, um, just download, um, you know, Docker and install the image, the, the right um, container, and bang, away you go. It does everything you need. It's completely game changer in terms of getting running, getting um, being more effective, right? But with that, had some cons. It was a little bit, a bit more of a setup cost. Someone had to do the work to get that get it done, um, and uh, lots. Of, it's quite hard to debug containers sometimes if they're broken, um, and sometimes it was problem with the uh, the bare metal, um, the stuff that, that 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 was going on there. But it would manifest in your container in a weird way. So that used to be really tricky um, to debug. And now as we get to infrastructure as code, you know, only use what you need, right? So it's like you've got this great ability to scale up, scale down, and use only things that you want. Um, the fact that, you know, all of the cloud providers have this um, idea of serverless code. So actually, we don't need to have a system running all the time. It's just an algorithm that does this stuff. We could run this on serverless, right? And it just spins up that code, runs a code, and spins down. So that was really cool for, um, you know, examples at zero. We had data pipeline stuff. So we'd have a log that needed processing at 9 a.m. in the morning. We didn't need it because previously we had to have servers and have redundancy. Now with, um, you know, a serverless stuff, we're just like, all right, trigger that process, spins it up, runs the stuff, spins down again, right? And so you've got all those different services there um, that we've got there. And so like, you know, all the providers also provide multiple services. So you've got databases now, you've got no SQL databases, you've got machine learning pipelines, you've got all these things that you can do that you can connect together that like used to be really, really hard to build and really time consuming. But now it's like, you know, it's almost like a crazy form of lego that you just piece it together and do all the things that you need right and scalability is nice um back in the day you know when we go back to that deploy by hand if we wanted scalability we had to ring up the data center and say hey um can you provide us with some extra machines or we had to buy the machines and then you had to order them you had to do the network gear you had to get them installed it used to take you know uh, anywhere from two weeks to a month for that to happen you know, now we're like, oh, we need more services. We just click the button and maybe within, you know, minutes, a few minutes, it spins up the next one, All right? So it's like mind boggling for me. You know, I used to paint over like crap. We need to um, increase our capability. We have to build out all these sort of things. We're going to have to buy all these systems or, or rent them or lease them or whatever. It used to take ages. And now it's like, it's pretty much at a click of a button. There are some cons with this stuff, of course. There is a big setup cost. It takes a while to learn all these things and all these systems and get it get it set up. Um, there's a lot of code, right, to get all these things working, all these config files. There's a lot of code now. And, um, you know, the good news is that it's all, a lot of this is available on the internet and you get all these templates of all these sort of things. Um, and this is actually the last thing is a, a comment from me is performance um, is quite interesting is the modern mindset is, you know what, like, do we want to spend time figuring out why this thing is slow, or do we just want to uh, upgrade the instance and get some more CPU power or more memory, right? So many times I've seen teams, um, they've got a performance issue with their system, and they're like, you know, it doesn't, it's not, it's going to take ages for us to debug this and figure this out. So let's just get a bigger instance and pay the money, right? And it's like, yeah, okay. You know, and for me, who used to uh, to worry about this stuff and, and spend a lot of time doing performance um, analysis and, and improvement, um, because like that was the box you had. We weren't getting any more money. We just had to make it go faster, right? So you know, I sort of like oh, these whippersnappers these days. They don't they don't do the hard yards anymore. So um, as a bit of a joke, this was a meme that came out back in the day, um, and it was totally true works on my machine so you know production's in a complete inferno um but you know works on my machine what's your problem now that that's absolutely how it used to operate about 10 years ago so 10 years ago um it was, that's the way the world worked the developers like oh, i don't know some something in production not it's got nothing to do with my code you know and that's the way it was which is um you know it's amusing to me because it's like we've moved on from that um as I mentioned, the key takeaway here is that scalability is a click away. Um, it's amazing that you can scale up or scale down. Um, you can have, you know, all these sort of things is just literally a click of a button or um, setting that up 
but it means that you need to think about your code to scale up and scale down as well, right? Um, so you know, as I said, like it's it's crazy that that you can do this compared to you know I can remember it's like we used to fret. Oh, you know, when I was in India, we, we were like, oh, we need a new machine. We were, um we we were lacking performance, and I had to order it. it. Had to come from the states, and you know, it was six weeks before it arrived. We cleared customs, and then someone would have to rack it up and install it and do all that stuff. So, you know, to have that at your fingertips is just awesome. All right. Another key takeaway, key concept through this process that has been really important is this idea of continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, you know, if if we're thinking about quality of the code and, and as we deliver these things and, and making sure that ultimately the whole goal here is that you know customers never experience downtime and you have um, really high quality of service is you have this idea that your code is always being tested so as you build it and, and you and you check it in it automatically gets checked and tested and make sure that it's of good quality and then continuous deployment is, is basically meaning it's always been tested um, and ready to go so that you know that um, when you deploy it's going to be relatively quick right you don't have a, have a problem and so I've seen uh, I've been in many organizations. I was at zero when I first started at zero. Um, you know, it was rolled out by hand, and um, they used to release once every six weeks because they used to do all that. they didn't do a lot of automated testing. Now um, they can release the entire system uh, in about forty five minutes um, because the, what people don't realize about zero is actually forty systems sitting under what is called zero. And they have to, you know, they're deploying different pieces of this and making sure everything runs. Um, and I would imagine, so that's my knowledge is two years old. I would hope they've got that down under sort of twenty minutes. Um, and you know, modern companies like like Google and this, they have the ability to, um, you know, roll out the code in minutes so that they, you know, you can you can test and sense all of this stuff. So these key concepts are things that that um, in the modern world you have to know. And you, you want to you want to definitely learn up on. Also, you know, all these things, all these changes have led to better quality, better reliability, and better scalability. So this is, you know, I stole this from the AWS site. And you know, why do you want to get involved in all this cloud stuff? Because you're ensuring that there's reliability of your system so that it stays up, it can scale and meet the demand. You can customize it to based on what you need and the things that enable you to deliver your services and all your products. It's efficient. So you're not spending extra effort, right? You've got security and confidentiality, and you can maintain it. If you if you had all those things, but you don't have maintainability, it would be a bugbear to look after. So you want something that's easy for you to look after it to make sure that you've got all these great um, things. So you know that's the, the big change. Um, it's all all of these things have improved dramatically, um, and and the cool thing is it's less effort uh, at the end of the day, which is which is amazing. Um, but this sort of sucks, you know. Um, back in the day, coders needed to know um, about data and algorithms and programming languages and a bit about the database and web development. Um, that was sort of it, right? So I think when I started, that's what we we did. We did those four things, right? And then we realized, well, oh, code management's sort of important. We should do that. Um, then it's like, you know, test-driven development improves quality. We should do that. And then we had IDEs, so, you know, the development environments, all that sort of thing come in. And then we started getting into these more, more modern practices of continuous integration to continuous employment. Cloud computing came on and containers. So now, you know, to be a fully fledged developer, you sort of need to know all these things, which is like nuts, right? Um, so, you know, I, I definitely feel for you because, you know, back in my day, um, it was you know the top four and you know you can get really good at those and then oh yeah code management makes a lot of sense i'll do that you know so we sort of added it on as we went now it's sort of the expectation that you have knowledge of all of this stuff or some knowledge right working knowledge of it um what i also say for those who are doing data is is, is the cloud unlocks machine learning and scale um a lot of things weren't possible before um you know all of these massive processing um, things like weather and um, all these things that used to have these massive supercomputers, now they can be done in the cloud, right? 
um, and you know running particular algorithms you know where you can just rent um, uh, some space to run a model and and to calculate all your training and get all the results um, that's just mind-boggling um, amazing for me because it's used to be you needed lots of computational power to do all this sort of thing and and now all the services provide this so you know it really means you've got the ability to unlock anything that you want to do um, it's out there and you can do it in a cost-effective way so why is all this stuff important uh, for, for all of you so first off it's not being taught my first and biggest bugbear um, only one school that I'm aware is Unitech are actually proactively teaching um, a lot of the cloud. Um, a lot of universities aren't doing, some of the politics are doing some, but it's just, it's not seen as a, a problem. So, you know, I, I'm going to share with you an insight. I went and asked some of the universities, why not? To which they came back and said, oh, you know, we don't want to push one vendor over another. And I went, well, that's cool i understand that but you're still not teaching them about the stuff that they need to know all right so it's sort of it's, it sort of sucks that it's not being taught the second thing is it's how we build things now right we build stuff in the cloud that's where that, that that's just how it works it's basically only very few people um build outside of the cloud these days um i, I was actually gobsmacked um uh, one of my friends who came and visited me, um, who, who works at Valve, the game company, um, and he he heads up a team that looks after Steam. Um, and for those guys, they uh, they run all their own systems. So he, he was literally going to Singapore to install some bare metal. And I was just like shaking my head, like, you sh people still do that? Like, it's crazy. But, you know, for everyone else, I can think of all the major businesses all running on the cloud, right? They're all doing it. Um, there's no point in hand rolling your own stuff anymore and looking after that stuff unless you're wanting uh, crazy stuff. So, you know, it's like for your career, this is how it's done now. So, you know, you got to know it. Um, the next thing and why it's important is you can build services at speed. Like if you're doing uh, data or you're doing, you know, building websites, you want them to scale. It's like you've got so many of these building blocks now that you can actually get something up and out there on the internet super fast, right? It's, it doesn't take a, a, a lot of things to do. It's, it's, just, it's just very easy and very quick um, to do it. So that, that's really cool that it, it doesn't require a lot of time anymore or, you know, the expertise is all there on the internet. There's lots of material and information that you can do it, right? So that's amazing. Uh, hang on, I've got to get this to work. Um, is that working? Can you see it? Um, what this also does, the cloud gives you the ability to create magic. So what I'm showing you is dynamic routing that Google did, right? Um, and it was, so they, they did this in um, 2005 or 2006, they released this. And I was actually at Google um, talking to them and I asked them how they did it. And, and so previously routing was super complicated and you get this this point and you'd have to throw it to a server and give you back an answer. Um, so what Google did is they said, um, what if we pre-generate every point to every point? Which sounds nuts, right? So they basically go, let's take all the uh, addresses in um, America and go every point, every point. I'm massively oversimplifying. What they did is actually go to every... They did it to um uh they 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 had particular blocks of uh, addresses and they'd go from one block to one block and then route within there, um but what it meant is they pre-generated all the routes, so they had all the server power they pre-generated it and made it and took it from being a dynamic problem to being a static problem it was already pre-defined, so with that they were able to have this magical thing that as I am on a web browser it's automatically updating as I move around my mouse. So it was, you know, everyone was like, how the hell did they do that? That is, you know, um, routing, the you know, thing about A-star algorithm and coding is one of the most complicated things you'll ever do. And they made it seem trivial. You know, it, it literally was, everyone said, this is magic, right? But they cheated. My takeaway is the cloud allows you to cheat. You can create magic because you can use the cloud um, to do things in advance so for you know and think about machine learning 
to machine learning or you know recommendations all these things is you can pre-generate it so that when you show it to a customer it's already known you're only showing them a, a, a few number of options it seems like magic to the customer it's just all this clever stuff done in the back right and so that's why you know to me the cloud is super fascinating and unlocks so many doors because you can do amazing things because you've you've pre-generated it right and it became a saying in all the businesses i've been involved in it's like what would google do because google goes hey we've got all these spare cpu cycles what could we do in advance so if you think about all the crazy things that google does auto suggests all these things they're not doing it dynamically they're doing it because they pre-generated all the information all right um so it's just a change in perception that is like how can i use this tool to my advantage right and that's what the cloud gives you which is really really awesome hang on how do i get to the next slide all right so oh, oh, this is the last thing skills to learn so ci cd so knowing how that works um knowing how you can have a uh, take code and deploy it up into production how it gets tested and make sure you got quality all that sort of stuff it's really really important um and there is a free service that you know you can you can use and play with it's part of github called github actions right um there's uh free tiers there that you could you know have one of your own little things you know what about um trying it out and understanding how that stuff works because this is how people build stuff now they use this stuff if you have knowledge of how it works it's going to give you an advantage with an employer right because that they, they definitely will have a deployment process that will work this way um release something to the cloud you know release the hounds um have an idea show how you can build this um and and do it one there was um a first year got a job this year and he came up to me at a career fair and he says do you think i've got a chance i'm only first year i don't know much I says, well, have you done any, you know, have you done any projects yourself? He says, yeah, I've been um, working for this charity and I built them a website. And, um, you know, I had to release it onto the cloud and, and do all this stuff. And I said, well, well, dude, you've already got an advantage. You've you've not only got a customer and you've worked with, a, worked with people, you've learned how to do something that they don't get taught at school. You don't get taught at school, but you've actually done this. And this is valuable to employers. And lo and behold, when he went out looking for a job, he got a job right because someone saw that he had these skills that were relevant to them as employers so you know if you can demonstrate that you know how to, to take some code and release it out onto the internet that's going to give you an advantage right there if you're interested in data um you know there's heaps of opportunities to play around and do stuff um uh out there so you know um google microsoft amazon they all have machine learning services there's free tiers um, to go and run some models and stuff so if you're going to play around why not play around with an experiment where you've actually thrown it against some you know hardcore models right um, and all of that sort of stuff um, believe it or not i've used some of the free services um, uh, some of you may be aware i teach kids coding um, a couple years ago we ran a project where um, we use watson um, as part of a kid's coding language called Scratch, and they did um, image recognition. So we did a basic model of um, recognizing people's facial expressions and converting those facial expressions into emoji, right? So it was a simple thing, um, and it was a simple training thing, but it was done out on Watson, right, um, out on the internet. So, you know, uh, I, I taught 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds how to use machine learning on the internet, um, which was fun. But, like, if you're into data and you want to do that stuff, then then have have a story to tell that's what you want to ha um, have a conversation with employers have a story to tell about going through and that experience and what did you learn and what did you find out and what was hard and what was not right that's what employers want to know is have something to show and lastly I want to talk very very quickly of that like with all this cloud stuff you know one of the reasons that um, a lot of companies never uh, have been on the cloud is this whole idea of the internet is scary hackers are there right um yes true but there's ways to protect it and and you're going to need to roughly know how that stuff works right um it's a big big deal um obviously there's good practices now to set up things so that um you know you can make them secure and um, all those sort of things but just have a, a working knowledge with this of how this stuff works because um you're going to need to know it right it's just 
a part and parcel of what we do now. Um, everyone uh, understands that their information and all their stuff on the internet um, is crazy, you know. Um, back in my life, I, I, I managed to catch a hacker um, uh, and I only caught him by, by accident because of time zones. I was in Australia, the hacker was in South Africa. I noticed that there was activity on our server um, at eight o'clock in the morning in, in, in Australia. Uh, and um, it made me look like, what are they up to? And the guy was doing a dictionary attack to try and get into our admin. Um, just through some wrangling uh, and uh, some persuasiveness from my point of view, um, I managed to get his cell phone number from the ISP, which he could never do anymore. And I rang him up and told him, hey, I know what you're up to. Cease and desist. Our lawyers will be talking to you tomorrow. All right, so I managed to catch this guy, but like it was a bit of a fluke. But you know, stuff on the internet um, is scary, and you're going to want to need to protect that. So, learning how all this stuff works in the cloud age is very, very important. All right, so that was a bit all over the place a bit about me, a bit about the things I've learned, a bit about my journey um, learning about um, systems and DevOps and stuff, uh, and why I think it's important. Um, so, now I open it up to questions. So one, one last thing is, as I look at the, the chat, if I figure out how to open the chat, um, as you can see, I've had, the way I describe my career is a series of adventures. Mm -hmm. I've done an um, amazing amount of stuff, traveled all around the world um, uh, and had that opportunity. Um, and that's because I had some skills, you know, as I said, way back at the start, skills that were valuable. Ponty needs some shoes. He didn't wear shoes back then. <laughs> does he still? Does he? He when when I met him, he he used two mice and he had foot pedals, two foot pedals and two mice, like <laughs> craziness. I've never seen anything like it. Hey, as while we're waiting for questions, uh, here's one going to come through. Oh yeah, here we go. Put a question in the chat. Um, how valuable was the MBA on your journey? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, so when I was in India and I was at this company, Bazi.com, um, I, you know, I was the CTO. Uh, you know, we had, it was just a very typical American style company in terms of structure. We had C, I had two CEOs, co CEOs, chief marketing officer, chief financial officer, uh, chief operations officer, and I was the CTO. I was the only one without an MBA. And I felt that I didn't know enough. Um, and then I went and did it at Victoria. Um, I don't regret it, but I realized what it told me is that my hunches and my gut feelings were pretty good because I sort of felt like I had no depth to say, like, I, I sort of feel that we should do it this way. And that's how, based on my observations and stuff that I've learned, but I didn't have any basis for that, right? Um, and, and what I learned. Um, at the MBA was was my gut instinct was pretty good, um, and that uh, you know um, I wasn't far off. Would I do it again? I don't know because I was paid a lot of money. It was twenty twenty five thousand dollars through the MBA. Um, I don't know if I'd do it again. To be honest, um, there's a uh, a number of alternative MBAs that you can read a bunch of books and uh, pretty much pick up the stuff. That's true, but you don't get to go with a cohort. One of the things with an MBA is you go, you go, you experience it with a number of people with a different number of skills, and you build a network, which is quite interesting. Any tips for learning um, continuous integration, solo developer? Yes. So, um, like, what if you? Um, were to build a website, something you put up on the internet, where you created a very simple, so you know, you go to GitHub, you go to GitHub Actions, and basically you could test the quality of that code. So every single um, language has a quality checker. Um, and I'm just trying to think of the name. Uh, it's called a lint, um, a lint. Um, so like JS lint or Ruby lint. Um, there's one called Ruby cop. Um, there's C, C sharp lint. There's all these things that'll check the quality of it to make sure that you've got right structure and used good good stuff. So get it to pass a check. 
and go through a process before it goes up into production, right? Um, and, and, and so you'll be able to do that just in your own code. And it'll teach you about things because when you hit a real workplace, having knowledge like, oh, I see, so this is what you're using for your quality checking and then you're running your automated tests and so on and so forth, you'll have the knowledge to go, I, I understand what they're doing rather than, oh my God, what the hell is this stuff? I've never seen this before, right? So that's what I'd recommend is give it, give it a crack with just something simple. Uh, Greg, you've got, from your perspective, would you say the current st state of cloud adoption in, in New Zealand? Um, many of the big companies are doing it, but it's going to be bigger. It's a gross sector. So remember, everyone, Amazon announced it first, then, then um, Google and Microsoft. So they're all putting data centers in New Zealand, right? Um, so that means that, you know, there's going to be a big push for these skills in New Zealand. And um, a lot of government departments haven't moved across. Um, one of the problems they had was sovereignty of data, because they don't, you know, were, did they really want their data to be in America? Because if your data sits in America, you are bound by American law. Um, you know, that guy that hacked my website um, uh, back in the day, um, our servers were in Virginia. So I was able to report him to the FBI because it was basically an attack on a, a, um, a, a, a foreign hacker attacking America. And I used that to my advantage, right? Um, but getting back to sovereignty, so data sovereignty is a big, big thing. And I think that will tighten up um, over time. So, and, and also think about it in terms of speed. If I could run my code in New Zealand, if I'm dealing to a New Zealand audience, that's way better than having my code sit in America. Right, because you've got that. You know, even the internet has to go all the way to round trip to West Coast uh, rather than going to Auckland. Right, and you're talking about the difference of. Um, so I'm going to go back in my geeky network days. Um, a local website like Trade Me has an eight millisecond response time. Uh, most local sites in New Zealand have sort of twenty to forty um, second response time. Going to the states, you're talking twenty, a hundred milliseconds. Right. Um, so that, that's why it would be better to have your code local. Uh, more orgs and agencies shifting to the cloud is still um, key inhibitors. Well, data sovereignty is one of them. Um, and there's just a lack of knowledge. There's not, um, there's some, some poor perceptions about things. And it's really, uh, the reality is um, you get more bang for your buck. It's more, more cost effective, but also, as we said, maintainable. Um, running, you know, running your stuff in the cloud is is cheaper and more maintainable and easier for people you have to have less um skills and less people uh next question do you have advice on building solid networking connections rather than association with other professionals um more so outside of projects um yeah so a big piece of advice is go to go to networking events um I expect this year meetups will become a thing again because of COVID. We've stopped. Um, it used to be my biggest advice with students um, was, do you want free beer and pizza um, three times a week, every week in your town and in the major cities? There will be a meetup dealing with some aspect of tech. You know, the C sharp uh, guys had a JavaScript guys had a thing. Um, Ruby um, user groups. There's you know, HTML, CSS, there's design, there's, um, you know, agile, business um, analysis, there's everything. Um, data people, there's meetups on any topic. Um, and yes, absolutely, because remember, jobs are connected to people. The more people you know, the better advantage you have in getting a job. It's better to be referred by someone as a person than to go onto a website blind and try and get a job. Absolutely. Uh, I've spoken to a few companies that say they found it actually costs less to move back to having their on-premises. Yeah, okay. Um, when they had a certain size. Yes, um, that's true. Um, that's very, very big companies. Um, and it's also uh, control that they want. Um, they don't like the fact that uh, someone else potentially has control over their systems. And if they if they care about performance, then the only way to guarantee that, you, that you've got performance is to have full control over those boxes, right? If you are at Amazon, you could be sharing a server with several other people, right? And so um, that's a risk you take, right? Uh, where do you find the meetups? Go to meetup.com. Meetup
Um, yeah, so, yeah, Salesforce user groups, AWS groups, Azure groups, uh, meetup.com. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Christmas is coming. It, it used to be one of the things we used to do at Summer Tech is we'd actually have a boot camp where we would get all the major user groups um, together and we'd um, get them to introduce themselves and what they talk about and and as a way for you to get an insight of like okay if i was going to go to one or two which ones would they be then you, you sort of hear from the people that um run them um and we used to do that maybe we need to do that again um as a way to connect back to industry yeah i mean um back before i used to had kids i used to basically be at three or four of these um every week um it's part of the reason why i never eat hell pizza anymore i um I went to too many of these things. Uh, I'm totally over hell pizza. But yes, definitely go to meetups. Awesome. Well, I think that's um, that kind of takes us to the to the end, John. Uh, we've gone a bit over time, so yeah, apologies for that. But thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, that was such a cool talk. I'm so blown away by so much of your story. And the Google Maps thing, I had no idea that they just did all that in advance. It seems like um, like an older way to do it, but you know it works because of the tech, like you said. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's. I I think the takeaway there is, think about what you can do with this capability that was sort of hard before, right? And that's and that's the thing. If you can do that, you can create something amazing and innovative. And it's actually not right. It's just been. Mm. I call it cheating, right? You mm. just you're just smart enough to know. I like to calculate that in advance, right? Um, and that's been the um, secret of a lot of my um, cleverness is taking an idea from one place and going, you know, they're not doing it right. I reckon I could do that better, All right? Mm. Um, so you know, re really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm sorry, a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit um, reminiscing on on uh, past life, but I thought it's sort of interesting for you to see how things have changed and why they sort of changed, so that you get. A feeling of why this stuff is important now and what what it gives you as an opportunity and that's that's really the thing i want you to take away is the cloud is so amazing and you can achieve so many things with this knowledge um that really it's just like the, the world is your oyster it's just an opportunity um that you got to take yeah. which is why you know we uh totally love what amber's doing and, and what she's put together here with the summer of cloud and we're fully behind it it's super exciting. Um, awesome, everyone. So, um, yeah, keep this conversation going on Slack. I hope you're inspired to go and search out some awesome projects and dive into some machine learning stuff so that you can beat all those 10 and 11 year olds who now know machine learning and facial recognition. Um, <laughs> so, the standard has been set. Uh, no pressure. John, thank you so much again. Um, it's just been a blast, as always. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you guys. Thank you.